My name is Holly Kenley, and I'm here today at the Anti-Bullying Institute in Riverside, California. And we are talking about cyberbullying. I'm going to be sharing some very important information you with you on how to protect your children. As we get started, I just want to remind all of us is that when we talk about protection, it's only human nature that we don't want to navigate from a place of fear. But we have to also be realistic is that when we put protective measures into place, we are reducing the risk of cyberbullying harm. We can't completely prevent it, but we can certainly put some good, strong safety measures into place. Here we go. thing to do is we, adults and parents and guardians, we need to educate ourselves and our children about some common sense safety measures. When I'm with professional audiences and lay audiences and parents and guardians, I often say to them, I want to think for just a minute how much time we spend we're preparing our children to drive. First of all, be a certain age before they can even get their permit. And then they have the practice time and they take the classes and they take the driving test and the written test. And even after we turn over the keys, and we ha watch them strap on their seat belt, feel that lump in our gut, tell us that we hope that they'll be so careful. We hope we've done everything we can to protect them as they drive down the roads and then the highways and then the freeways. And it kind of surprises me that when we turn over a piece of technology to a person, that we don't do very much, or sometimes we just do a little in preparing them to navigate the cyber world, the cyber freeways, and byways. So the first thing that we're going to do and to help protect our children is that we're going to prepare them. This important. Guardians and parents and, and those that are entrusted with the care of our young people, number one, know why you are turning over a piece of technology to them. Reason or reason right there. Communicate that with your partner, your spouse, or another trusted adult, and check that and make sure it's a good reason. And appropriately, communicate that to your children. This is why I'm turning over this technology to you. And the second thing is to know its purpose, how to be used. And that as well to your children. Know some, have some rules and some expectations and some guidelines about when it's to be used, how much is to be used, and where to spend time on that. And by just a reminder that most social networking sites require that young people are 13 years old before they go on that social networking site. And we need to do is prepare children. The thing is, we need to supervise and monitor our children. Many came to parent groups and audiences. I'm asked, Holly, right, to super monitor my children. Do I have a right to invade their privacy, either online or off? Inside, I am screaming, yes, you do. But all seriousness, in all seriousness, I say very respectfully is that we have a responsibility to protect our children. And so with that, we need to supervise and monitor them. And in just a few moments, I'm going to show you how to do that very respectfully so that we're not, quote, unquote, in their privacy. Now, two suggestions. One, and this is from the experts in the field, that there should be designated spaces for the technology. Technology, cell phones, laptops, computers should be kept in a common area. That be the living room, that might be the kitchen, office area, that might be the den, consoles, everything. All screens should be kept in a common area. Why? A couple reasons. One, because it's easier to supervise and monitor. Number two is that we know that young people who are their cell phones in their bedrooms are staying up late at night. And then from other screen dangers, they are not getting the sleep that they need. The deep sleep, they're texting, they're with their friends, spending time, or going on the 
social networking sites. So that was a second rule is that we want to have designated native times to unplug. The experts agreement that there should absolutely be no screens in the bedroom. I know parents, guardians, that's hard to hear, but that includes us as well. Going back to the sleep issue, but also going back to the protective issue and keeping our children safe. So no screens in the bedrooms. We're going to unplug when it's time for them to go to bed and go to sleep. A couple of other suggestions are unplugging at meal time, giving them time to connect as a family face-to-face, -face, and all while driving in the car. Those are a couple of suggestions. I also want to share at this time is that we know from commonsensemedia.org, which is doing the latest research on screen and screen time and healthy practices around our screens, is that yet from ages 12 to 18 are spending an average of nine hours a day on their screens. And that's not including school time or homework time. Young people ages 12 to 18 are spending about six and a half to seven hours a day on their screens, not including homework time and school time. And adults are spending about the same amount of time, six to seven hours a day, not including their work time. We want to have those times to unplug where we can come together as a family and communicate face to face. And I'll be speaking more about that when we get to prevention. Protective measure, of course, are the technological solutions. And there's so many really good apps out there. And I want to just draw three to your attention. And the way I have no financial um, agreement with or anything to do with any of the people that I'm talking about, I just respect the work they're doing and I want to bring those resources to you. Bob is a new app. It's just been launched in 2017, and you can see the website right there, boscoapp.com. And the thing that I really like about this, and I've communicated with the co is it, it sends, it's a soft application that has an al algorithm that you detect when there's something harmful that comes out its way or they're sending out something harmful, and it notifies you. So it respects privacy while still protecting them. I'd like to uh, download this next to software, reword, and rethink. And I like them so much. Because when someone is writing something, they're posting something, is that this is content uh, software that's sensitive, uh, content sensitive, excuse me, filtering software. And when someone's writing something unkind or insensitive, it picks it up. And with word, it draws a line through it. With think, a little bubble pops up, and it prompts the author to rewrite and reword what they're writing. We shall studies that over 90% of the time people have changed what they're writing. This is important because the whole point is we're trying to, to catch inappropriate behavior and we're trying to correct it. Another way to protect our children is to use our blocking and filtering software where parent guardians make sure that you set your parental controls and in there and check the privacy settings and the, set the parental, parental controls, excuse me, and also make sure that you take time to sit down and look at your uh, web browser history where you look to see where your child has been spending time. To say that the best blocking and filtering software are the parents or guardians. Report to the internet service provider or the site. I think years ago or so, not as much was being done that could have been, but now I think it's gotten a lot better. Again, more content sensitive in their filtering software, so do report it. If some harmful comes your child's way, you might want to, of course, take down the profile at least and to dealt with the issue and also report it and have a record that you have reported it. Also, I want you to know that there are so many wonderful websites out there that have protective tools in place. 
some of the, one of the problems is is that we have so much information out there that parents don't know where to start. Although I have four, four of them up here on the slide, I'm highlight two of them. The first is Cyberbullying Research Center at cyberbullying.org. This is a that it was found in 2005. Jackson and Samir Hinduja actually started blogging about cyberbullying in 2002, and then they founded this center, as I said, in 2005. In this site, there are newsletters, there are blogs, there are free downloads with tips and strategies, parents, to help you with almost anything you're looking for as we go cyberbullying. They've also written numerous books that are wonderful. The organization I'm going to be referring to on is the Family Online Safety Institute, FOSI.org. organization an international organization that's given to the world as a place online in 2007. It was Stephen Balk. And they, again, have so many free tools and downloads on their site for parents and guardians and those of us entrusted with the care of young people. And it's free. Lao, I was, had the pleasure of going up to San Francisco and attending a, a forum of theirs called the Adaptable Mind. And the pleasure of meeting so many of these wonderful folks and thinking about some more strategies and tools that they have for you that I'm speaking about. This is so important. We just need to educate our young people and put protective measures around them, and we need to remind ourselves about those protective tools and strategies. At the same time, we need to remember that we are dealing with a generation, and now almost two, that has not only been raised with technology, but by technology. Some Tali, are you against technology? And I say, absolutely not. Of given my age and my generation, I'm not a native. And at first, I had to kind of be drug in a little bit begrudgingly. But I raised it as a researcher and author in the field of psychology. I'm on social networking sites and blogging and all that kind of thing. And I'm really glad that I am. Be a pulse on what's going on in this world and get, understand why the technological world is so important to young people. Sometimes we have parents and guardians who are raising, again, children that know technology. And what I do is I ask families to answer this question, what's best for my family in my tech generation? And what are the best practices that I can implement to make sure that my family is safe. So I said I was going to share something with you that would show you how to monitor and supervise your children, but with respect. And here is the tool that I'm going to share with you. It's called the Family Online Safety Contract. And out by the Family Online Safety Institute. There are others of these online. But this is a free download, and I really like it, and I want you to look at it there on the screen, and this is important. As you see, there's a side for the child, and there is a side for the parents. And so what you're going to do is you're going to bring your family together, and you're going to talk about what's working for you and maybe not working as well. And with your children's input, as, as you were leading this discussion, Parents, you're going to write down the rules and expectations for yourself and responsibilities are in keeping your children safe and going to help your children compose age appropriately you need to do as well what expectations are and what their guidelines are. I can't see it very well in the on this but number nine speaks specific to what I was talking about a few minutes ago. Ago, where it says that you as a parent are going to sit down and monitor on a weekly basis, maybe twice a week, and to the social networking sites, check their texts, 
check whatever you've allowed them to do. At the child side, it says that they know that and they expect that. So there's this invasion of privacy. There isn't anyone getting upset because you've monitored and supervised them. You've done the hard work up front and set rules and guidelines. Share a brief story for a moment. My stepdaughter has just been an amazing, amazing digital parent. Our daughter is graduating from high school this year. She phone during her tween and teen years. She had an iPhone, a smartphone, until she was 16. She went to two social networking sites at age 15. Hey, she's still on two social networking sites. And how long my stepdaughter has checked and monitored her texting, her social sites on a weekly basis. There's disrespect. They have a very healthy relationship as about what's going on as our granddaughter spends time enjoying social networking sites, but also allowing that monitoring and supervision with respect. Guardians, this piece, in my opinion, is fashionable to the protection of your children. Number two is to know the net neighborhood. Again, parents and guardians, I think it's so interesting how when our children are going out in the neighborhood or they're going out with friends, we want to know where they're going, we want to know why, we want to know how long, and we want to know what they're doing and if anyone is going to be supervising. And yet, we have time sometimes to get to know that about their net neighborhood. So it can be built into contracts where you're going to take time to see where they're visiting, learn spending time. Learn about their neighborhood to protect them and treat it as about protection. Number three is that we're going to communicate with our children about real friends versus cyber friends and a real world cyber world. Therapist, this is one of the things I am so concerned about. Schools and cyber friends. It's about five years ago when I was doing some research. Young people were asked if between the real world and the cyber world. And about the percent of them said yes. Yes. We did research is that there is no difference. It's all the thing. And so it's a cross that's hurtful or harmful. It's confusing to our young people. Why would me that they don't even know me? Just sit down with them and have that conversation about real friend is. What is what is trust? Witness, what is compassion? The young people call their cyber friends their fake friends. And what end send a harmful message to you? Conversation and the same thing about their real worth and their cyber worth. Well, gosh, when we were growing up, what our external sources of influence were important to us. We cared what other people said and what other people thought. Yes, but now the pressure is so much different because it's 24 7. We know that their cyber worth is important. We know that young people post on certain days and that if they get enough likes, posts, retweets, or reshares, they take it back down. Speaking to young people about their cyber worth, I say to them, your cyber worth is artificial and it's fleeting. And it's like others. And is authentic and lasting. And to you, you. So you have that conversation. Pretense the harms by having them turn into real sources of worth and value. And in protecting them is to implement safety measures for the cyber victim. That would be for a low level of victimization. This is a business. It's a member. We want to communicate this to our young people. If anything harmful comes your way, do it text a post, a tweet, whatever it might be. Stop, do not respond. Say, don't do it. And if you can, print it out or keep a record of it and share it with a trusted adult. And it's in guardians, that might mean that you share it with legal authorities if it's serious in nature. So, once again, 
a very common protective tool, stop and do not respond, save and don't share it, uh, me, and print it out if you can, and share it with a trusted adult. Also, it's very important to thank your child or the young person for coming to you and sharing the information with you. If it's a low level of cyberbullying, implement some reasonable consequences. For most, find out why the cyberbully that he or she did, find the motivation was, and then get a contract into place. The family online safety contract, maybe something even at school, depending on where this is taking place. This is parents and guardians. The number one thing that they, parents and guardians do when they see that there's been some cyberbullying or some cyber harm is they take the technology away. And unfortunately, that doesn't do anything to correct the behavior. As we get peace, and this is really important about protection, as I at the beginning, is that this is not the responsibility of just one person. It's just one group to address this. We have a culture of cyberbullying. It just isn't among young people. It's everywhere. So we have to look at this as a team responsibility. I'm thinking a lot to parents and guardians. I do want to add one other piece that is super important. And the guardians or any facilitator, adult leader can take part of this wonderful program. It's called How to Be a Good Digital Parent. And it's put out by Family Online Safety Institute. This is a free program. And I did this a couple of months ago to a PTA meeting at a local elementary school in the area that I live. What you do is go online to the Family Online Safety Institute, FOSTI.org, and you'll sign up and they will email you all the materials. This is how to be a good digital parent. And what I love about this is seven simple steps. They'll send you materials. They'll send you the PowerPoint. They'll send you the leader's guide, the script, everything you need. It only takes about 20 minutes to a half hour. And then if you want time for questions and answers, you can carry it into that. And I'll send you a little video telling you how to do the presentation. So. Get together with a PTA group, get together with a youth group, a church group, and start helping other parents be good digital parents. We're in this together. And by the way, the Family Online Safety Contract is part of the seven steps. Responsibility, I've talked a little bit about this. We need to remember to communicate with our youth. Sometimes I'm an acceptable use policy at school or other Places, but we need to communicate that with them that with this iPad or with this iPhone or with this laptop, that that gives you so much freedom and wonderful. But with that, those rights and those freedoms come risk. With that risk is social responsibility and accountability. Just like you do when you're allowed to drive, you have that preparation and you get your license. But still, you have to be responsible and accountable for your behaviors when you're driving. It's true. You're responsible and accountable for your behaviors when you're online. Thirdly, this is really important. What will happen when as a child, we have one of these horrific events that are happening at schools and other places. It seems like we want to sometimes point the finger and say parents aren't doing enough or the schools aren't doing enough or the law enforcement is not doing enough. And once I just want to say that we all have to come together and to do our piece. Schools and youth groups and clubs and camps materials that I'm going to share with you it will make it so easy for you to help out, for you to begin facilitating some programs and getting it from your vantage point, from your lens. The first share with you is called Our K-12 Digital Citizenship Curriculum. 
put out by Common Sense Media, Common Sense Education, their website, commonsense.org. Incredible. As a teacher, I look at these lesson plans and it is a teacher's dream come true. It is on multiple intelligences put by Howard Gardner, the father of multiple intelligences, and Harvard School of Education. Educators who may be listening, teachers, counselors, administrators, this is aligned with the common core. Are ready to go. Again, it's a teacher's dream, a facilitator's dream come true. And here's the important piece it's K 12. Lessons that can be implemented easily into an advisory class, in homeroom, into after school club, in youth group. They're ready to go. But we have to be consistent. We can't have a one and done. We need doing this every week, once a week, or twice a week, 10 to 15 minutes whatever you can embed into your current program. The second program is words wound, delete cyberbullying, and make kindness go viral. This is by the Cyberbullying Research Center. I have read the book from cover. The book does cost, but all the other materials are free downloads. The curriculum is free. In my opinion, I have talked with Sir Hindujan it can cross most grade levels, but I think in particular it's really well suited for immediate tween through middle school teen curriculum. A beautiful program that can easily be embedded in an advisor class, a homeroom, youth clubs, and so on. Getting to the K-12 digital citizen uh, curriculum, that is all a free download. Another search, and I highly recommend, is called Don't Laugh at Me. The adult program is based on social emotional learning. We know emotional intelligence, EQ, is a better predictor of social skills, better social skills, and a better predictor of doing well than school. Doing well in school, more so than I do, or intellectual. Intelligence um, is amazing. It was really developed by Peter Yarrow. How many of you out there that are listening are around my generation? I was raised in the 60s, but there was a folk group called Peter, Paul, and Mary, a very famous group. And one of those folk group is Peter Yarrow. He bullied horrifically as a child growing up. And so in 1999, he founded the organization. Operation Respect, and his team have put together this curriculum, Don't Laugh at Me. The love about this program is that there's a lot of music embedded into it, a lot of the performing arts, creative arts. It's very, very creative. Again, this is aligned with the common core, if that's important to you. The program that I've developed is called Power of Words. As I said ago, I'm so concerned about young people and their cyber worth. As their cyber worth and their cyber reputation is affecting and influencing them. And this isn't a one stop and we're done. It is a curriculum. There is an assembly that precedes it and curriculum that I've developed that will help young people to discover design, and determine their own worth and decisions based on Worth, what is authentic and lasting. More information on my website. And I want to forget that, not quite lastly, as we're getting towards the end, is that in the team responsibility, of course, therapists, clinicians, and healthcare professionals. Do you, what services are, are you offering? What groups are you leading? It would be so easy, easy to take one of these curriculum and to be a group around. It. Are you saying in newsletters and professional materials that would help your clientele to resources or others? Community advocacy. I'm today at the Anti-Bullying Institute 
I had the pleasure last summer of speaking at their anti-bullying conference, which is an amazing gathering of educators and health professionals and, and uh, folks in the community, law enforcement, all kinds of us came together to help educate and to bring awareness to the bullying issue and the bullying issue. Other thing we did in my community is a few years ago is that we screened the bully movie. Eric Smalley from Stand for the Silent, who lost his precious son, Ty Smalley, who died took his own life after chronic, ongoing bullying. And the father has made it his mission to go out and to speak to schools. He came to our area and he gave six assignments. He spoke to a community open forum. And then we screened the bully movie and he did a Q&A afterwards. Current chapters of Stand for the Silent all across this nation and internationally provides materials for ongoing sustained change and support with this issue. And of course, the importance of law enforcement and policymakers. We do that. And a reminder that as a team approach, we all need to come together and implement programs that will build up the policies and law that we have on the books because of the programs that doesn't help those to come to fruition. And so remembering that it is a team approach, we're in this together. Next, we intervene when the unthinkable happens. We're going to be talking about strategies for the cyber bully and the cyber victim. Stay with